Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here, and welcome to our next Kerbal Science episode. Today we're going to try a very interesting experiment where we're going to try to collide two identical vessels at double orbital speed. Now, I haven't tried this before. In fact, I don't even know if it's possible, so we're soon going to find out if it is. What we're going to do here is send two identical vessels, one in a prograde direction to rotate in the same direction as Kerbin spins, and one to go in the opposite direction in a retrograde orbit. This vessel is very simple. We only need to get to low Kerbin orbit, so we've got a parachute. We've got a command pod for three Kerbals. We've got a decoupler, quite a large RCS tank. We've got the largest reaction wheel, an X200-16 fuel tank. We've got four RCS thruster blocks spaced evenly around the vessel. And you'll notice there that our vessel information from Kerbal Engineer is showing 19 ton for this second stage. The engine we've got on our second stage there is the Poodle engine. This is a great engine to use simply because it's not too heavy and we only need a very small amount of thrust to manoeuvre ourselves into the correct positions in our orbit. So what we're going to do is launch two of these vessels one after the other and we're actually going to show the launches side by side. So we're all good to go here, we're going to launch. So as you can see here we've got our vessel on the left and we've got our vessel on the right. The vessel on the left is going to be going in a retrograde manner in relation to Kerbin's rotation. And the vessel on the right of course going in a prograde direction with Kerbin's orbit. This is of course going to mean that our vessel on the left hand side is going to have to fight against Kerbin's rotation first of all. So the amount of delta V needed to get into the same orbit is going to be slightly more. As we pass 500 meters per second, we now turn to make sure that we're getting as much horizontal velocity as we can with both of our vessels. Now our target altitude for both of these vessels is exactly 100 kilometers. You can actually see the apoapsis numbers climbing there in the top left of the screens. And as our apoapsis climbs to that 100,000 meter mark, we're going to immediately switch off our engines. There we go there. And of course from this point on we only want to do the rest of our burn to achieve orbital speed right on that apoapsis marker. Obviously on the left hand side there you can see there's already a vessel in a counter orbit to the one that we're going for on the left. That's because the vessel on the right was launched first. As both of our vessels hit the apoapsis marker they are both doing a burn to achieve their orbital velocity. And of course we want to raise our periapsis to the exact same 100,000 meter mark. Our vessel on the left of course lacking around 400 meters per second compared to our vessel on the right and that of course again is because our vessel on the left was launching retrograde in comparison to Kerbin's rotational speed. And engine cutoff there on our Poodle engine on the left. Both of our vessels now very very close to that 100 kilometer apoapsis and periapsis marker but there's still some work to do. Now each vessel of course needed quite a few very very small tweaks. I just basically kept on making extremely small adjustments right on the periapsis and apoapsis markers. In fact the adjustments were so small I was largely using RCS thrusters just to make those very very small numbers up. And you can see there we've got that constant altitude pretty much sorted from our Kerbal Engineer readings. So now that our orbits are pretty much exactly spot on to each other, we now need to ensure that our vessel's inclinations are absolutely perfect. Rather than an inclination of zero degrees, we want to get an inclination of 180 degrees and we want to get very close to that. You can see here we're pointing to the relative inclination readout in Kerbal Engineer. Now you need Kerbal Engineer to do this because Kerbal Space Program will actually round these numbers up and tell you that you're already at 180 degrees. You can see here as we warp around to our ascending node that we're at 179.978 in our relative inclination. And even though this sounds extremely close, it's actually nowhere near enough to get an actual collision. It needs to be absolutely as perfect as we can get it. As we time warp around here, you can see in the rendezvous section of the Kerbal Engineer panel that our time to relative ascending node is actually dropping. As soon as that countdown hits the zero, we're making our very, very fine adjustments. Just making those very, very small adjustments with the RCS. And slightly going back the wrong way there, but we're trying to get that as close as possible. We're going to have to make another correction. 
We're now at 179.99948. We're getting very, very close. Just a little more tweaking to do. Just time warping around again, this time to our descending node to do our next correction. Now, of course, we're looking at the time to relative descending node readout. Two, one, and just doing a little correction there. And there we have it, 179.99999. Now, I challenge anyone to get something closer than that. So we've got our encounter set up probably as close as we're going to get, although encounter is probably not quite the right word. <laughs> just doing some final checks over all of our numbers here to make sure that we're on target. And we're just going to start time warping our two vessels in together. I've done a quick save there so we can quick load and retry this over and over again. For the moment though, I am switching to our vessel approaching from the retrograde direction. We'll just pan the camera around here. We should be able to see our other vessel coming in here in a second. Holy sh**. Look how fast this thing's coming. You can see the kilometers dropping by the second. 10Ks, 5Ks, and oh, there it goes. <laughs> it's already 20 kilometers away in the distance. Oh dear. So we need a slow motion of that just to see how close we actually got. 85 meters by the looks of that. So we'll just do a quick load and we're going to watch this again from another angle after doing a very slight tweak. And there we go, we can see it flying straight past. We'll just slow that one down again to see how close we got that time and 13 meters and extremely close. And another attempt. Three, two, one and oh there it goes again. So watching a few more attempts of this and what I have found out of course is that the frame rate of Kerbal Space Program is actually not allowing me to get the collision. Essentially this means that we need to get our collision right on the render of the frame. Oh and that one was very close. We'll slow this one down and have a look. That was down to 11 meters. I'm actually wondering if we're actually going to be able to get this collision, but by golly, that one was close. Let's see that one in slow-mo. That would have only been, that's eight meters. Trying this again and, oh, jeez. <laughs> that one was super close. Oh my goodness, look at this slow-mo, five meters, five meters, and look, it went straight through it. Here we go again, come on, oh, jeez. Oh, geez, that one was close as well. And and that one's actually passed straight through as well. It's absolutely on target. Oh, I'm about to give up on this. I don't think we're going to be able to get it. Come on. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, 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 oh I got it. <laughs> oh, I didn't think we'd be able to do it. Oh, that's fantastic slow motion. Oh, wow. I clipped it right on the back. <laughs> And there we go, all of that velocity wiped out in a very tiny fraction of a second. And just looking at that orbiter there now, it's lost all of its velocity in that one hit. We've just got one little command pod, everything else has come off it, and everyone's still alive! <laughs> How is everybody still alive? Jeb, Bill and Bob. Although saying that, they're not going to be alive for long. There's no parachute and we have got a straight plummet now, straight into Kerbin. Oh dear, dear, oh dear. Uh, this is not boating so well for our three Kerbinauts. This has been a very, very, very strange experiment. I'm very sorry, Jeb, Bill, and Bob. Very luckily, though, we can always quick load and try again, re entering the atmosphere. And. Oh, sorry guys, sorry guys, although frankly the fact that you survived the g-force is uh, ridiculous. Anyway, we'll switch back to our other craft which is still in orbit, amazingly, to see if everyone, anyone is alive here. And they're still alive as well, they're still alive as well. That's bizarre, and they've actually pretty much kept the same orbit. So just a little science lesson on kinetic energy and you may remember if you've seen previous science episodes that we've done this in the past. Here of course we're making the assumption that the entire 19 tons was completely absorbed by the kinetic energy which wouldn't have been the case but we'll use this as an example. 
We can easily calculate the amount of energy that is created when 19 tons of something crashes into something else. For a more in-depth explanation on this formula, check out the Delta V calculations science video I did not that long ago. Basically what we do to calculate the amount of energy is take half of the weight of our vessel multiplied by the velocity in meters per second. When our collision occurred there, we were moving at roughly 4,492 meters per second. And then we square that value to give us 191.6 billion joules, or 191.69 gigajoules. Now, how much energy is that, I hear you ask? 191 gigajoules works out to be 53,247.5 kilowatt hours. Almost five years of power with a typical family home. Another typical way to measure this sort of energy would be to compare it to tons of TNT in an explosion which works out to be 45.817 tons of TNT. That is a colossal amount of energy. This great little image from the European Space Agency shows just how much force a small 1.2 centimetre projectile can have. In fact, just a few months ago you may have heard of the International Space Station window being hit by a very small object causing a crack in the glass. And it turns out that it may have only been caused by a very high velocity fleck of paint. It really is mind boggling just how much energy is in the velocity of things travelling at orbital speed. Of course everything in KSP is actually scaled right down to around one tenth of its real value compared to Earth, so Earth's orbital speed is much 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 faster again. So I hope you enjoyed that video, if you have any questions for me please do whack them in the comments below, thank you very much to all of you that have subscribed, and for those who haven't yet please do subscribe to see more, follow me on Twitter at Marcus House Game, and we'll see you in the next video. So let's now take a more extreme example. Let's now add 100 meters per second, the same amount, while traveling at a much higher velocity. So when we were at our burn point at Eve's periapsis of around 100 kilometers from the surface, we were moving at around 4,400 meters per second.